Hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you. So many familiar faces. Hopefully, uh, as Anna said, um, hopefully you uh, maybe hopefully you were here in the last two days for our conference. But hopefully, I was able to change enough slides to make this interesting. But uh, if, if you're going to be yawning, I'm not going to take it personally. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm so glad to be here. Um, we, uh, you know, have been leading the FinTech Open Source Foundation now for three years, uh, actually five years in total. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of the history. Uh, we now have uh, about 50 members in the foundation, um, a pretty diverse uh, set of companies. Um, clearly, our sort of major footprint is in, in financial services, uh, financial, large financial institutions, which, you know, until a few years ago, it was uh, a bit of an oxymoron when it comes to uh, open source, um, especially if you consider that we now have reached about 50 projects um, that are you know, hosted under the Finos umbrella. Um, pro actually, projects and special interest groups. Uh, and I think special interest groups do play an important part um, in, in the way we are bringing the industry together because not everyone, as you know, is ready to collaborate uh, through code. Uh, and so, actually, you know, as, as we hopefully uh, will learn today, uh, special interest groups do play kind of a really nice stepping stone to, um, you know, bringing people together and, and show them the value of collaboration. Um, one more thing I want to say about this slide, apart from the sort of pretty logos and, and uh, you know, both financial institutions and technology firms, is that we have recently, we joined the Linux Foundation about a year and a half ago, we used to be an independent uh, nonprofit, um, and part of that we added the associate membership, which is you know a free tier of membership for nonprofits uh, and you know govern governmental. I really have a problem with that with that word, Gov governmental <laughs> organizations uh, and uh, industry consortia, financial services and industry that has been you know working through consortia and uh, uh, you know industry bodies for a long time and we're super happy to continue bringing in existing standard bodies in the foundation in a way that we can accelerate their standardization process through actual open source and, and concrete code collaboration. I'm a, as much as I like to put in my description that I'm an executive, I'm a, I'm a developer at heart. Uh, so I feel much more comfortable in this clothes than uh, what I was wearing yesterday and that really uh, um, helps sort of again bringing more uh, old style i would say consortia to, to code centric collaboration um, quick plug if you go to landscape.finos.org again you're probably familiar with the construct of the landscape in in linux foundation projects uh, you can take a look at sort of the almost 50 projects and six that we have in the foundation um, Especially the last two years, um, so I don't have a nice graphic for 2019, uh, but 2020 and 2021 has shown a massive growth um, in our community. Uh, we grow in members, in projects, and most importantly, we grew up to a thousand contributors uh, over time in the foundation. Um, and so we are also structuring the team uh, accordingly. This is a point that I'm going to make later, um, but. Howard is a pretty high-touch community, as you would expect. Uh, financial services, uh, you know, it's largely focused, we're focused in London and in New York. And again, it's an industry that is very time-intensive, uh, resource-intensive, you know, uh, uh, attention-starved uh, uh, in a way. And so there is, I think, compared to other more mature communities, uh, an element of, of needing to always bring the value uh, um, in people's face, really. Uh, and so that requires, you know, generally, I think, more um, team support uh, from, from sort of the foundation standpoint. Um, part of this growth, and this is actually, um, uh, you know, a table that makes me, our leaderboard makes me pretty happy uh, when I look at it, not just because we've, you know, we're seeing active code contributions, uh, but mostly because if you look at the top six contributors um, in our foundation, that's an year-to-date graph. I literally went and copy-pasted every number in uh, from our metrics dashboard. Um, 
it's only banks. And you know, uh, this is pretty unprecedented. Again, five or six years ago, um, you wouldn't have seen banks you know, taking the leap and le being leading contributors to open source projects. Uh, that doesn't mean the banks have not participated to open source foundations in the past. You know, we have sister foundations like Hyperledger or uh, you know, CNCF that have had membership and sponsorship from banks. But when it comes to code contributions, um, that wasn't necessarily the case. So we're really, really proud. And honestly, if you think about how the industry works, you know, having banks being active contributors mean that, means that all sort of the other parties of the ecosystem will be probably enticed, whether it is uh, their counterparties on the buy side, whether it is tech vendors and fintechs that want to interact with banks. Uh, and so we think this is, you know, part of uh, a very hopefully solid and sustainable ecosystem moving forward. Of course, it hasn't always been the case. Uh, and so I want to go a little bit uh, uh, on a trip down memory lane. Um, this is an article from eight years ago, nine years ago. Um, again, this is just one of the many. If you, if you sort of go a little bit back, you know, if you do a search on Google, say, six years, seven years back, um, you'll find plenty of articles like the sentiment <laughs> around open source in financial services wasn't necessarily you know, very positive. Again, that said, most banks have been long-time consumers of open source. So I think this is more of a question of contributing to open source rather than uh, consuming. Um, funny enough, when we started in 2015, we had several of our institutions telling us, oh no, we, we don't use open source. It's like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> Again, from a, from, a, from a compliance standpoint, especially for a regulated industry, that's probably the worst possible answer that you're going to get. I think people are going to get paused here. Like, oh, uh, developers always find a way, especially when something is valuable uh, and accelerate the productivity. So, um, to the point, and this is again about 10 years ago, um, it's been a pretty big story 10 years ago when uh, there was a lawsuit uh, started by Goldman Sachs against one of their former employees who allegedly took code from the high frequency trading system, put it into a subversion repository. Uh, now the defense was that that was mostly open source code. Uh, that was what, again, the developer admitted, or, or uh, sort of that was his position. Um, this uh, lawsuit, I think, is still going on. There's been like seven or eight back and forth. But again, the point I'm trying to make here is that open source was considered as a very big risk in the industry. Uh, um, and, you know, to a certain extent, it still is. We, we, uh, we're going to see, hopefully, in the next slides, um, we just released a state of open sourcing financial services report yesterday. Um, and again, there's still a long way to go. But definitely, 10 years ago, the prevalent sentiment was it's not worth it. It's, it's too much of a risk, again, in a very risk-averse industry. Uh, but then somewhere mid-last decade, some things started to change. Um, this is interestingly the same publication, um, four years difference, I believe. Yes, so 2013, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, a software called SecDB uh, at Goldman Sachs. Um, again, I don't come actually from the industry, so forgive me if I'm um, not exactly describing that uh, functionally <laughs> correctly, but it's uh, a software that they got through an acquisition that is used throughout the whole firm that was widely considered as, uh, you know, their secret sauce about eight years ago, um, to the point that people were saying, you know, is this what gives them a hedge versus other firms? Now. That software is based on an internal programming language called Slang, which, you know, even four years later, um, the same publication, the same software was saying, is this a liability for Goldman Sachs? Because it's hard to find talent that can actually continue developing that software. It's an, you know, an internal language developed internally at Goldman Sachs that simply is no talent out there. They have to train folks. Um, as, for example, compared to you know, other financial institutions who built their single dealer platforms on Python, for example. And so not only they were able to get talent to 
you know, work on the platform, but also the open source community was, you know, started to build this very lively ecosystem of AI, ML components that are, you know, fundamental in a sort of trading uh, uh, financial services environment. So it's interesting how to see this, again, very same publication. I don't know if it's the same journalist. No, that would have been amazing. Um, but, but, you know, just shows how the, from a strategic standpoint, the, the sentiment was, was changing. And so, a few years ago, we started seeing some sort of dipping their toes from the industry into uh, contributing code. Open Mama is a project under the Linux Foundation. Originally, uh, I think it's still led by JP Morgan and Deutsche Bank. It's now under Finos. AMQP is an advanced uh, messaging queuing protocol. Again, open source by JP Morgan with the help of Red Hat. Um, top right is, is an effort that actually um, failed, I, I think, for you know, problems with governance and how it was set up. It's called Lodestone. It's a, a, actually an effort by Deutsche Bank and HSBC. And then on the bottom right, in 2015, the Symphony Software Foundation, which is the predecessor of Finos uh, that I was called to run at the end of 2015, was really an effort to create an open source chat collaboration platform that would uh, you know, be an alternative, a more open alternative to uh, Bloomberg. And, um, and if partly the, the banks invested on the for-profit venture, but they also created an actual open source foundation that was largely uh, independent. And, you know, again, kind of going in the right direction as we are more used to see uh, uh, sort of foundations operate. Now, why is it that <laughs> we're seeing, you know, this, this sort of... Uh, sort of strategic change of vision uh, when it comes to, to open source in the industry. I think there are sort of macro reasons, uh, at least three macro reasons, and I wanna make sure I stay on time here because I, as you probably noticed, I can talk. Um, <laughs> so the first and, and foremost reason, and I think in my mind it all starts from the strategy. There are of course still big challenges and we're gonna talk about them, but there's change cannot be enacted unless there is a sort of a strategic uh, understanding or, or sort of macro factors in the industry that have driven this. Um, so over the last 10 years, uh, there has been a major shrinkage of sort of the income of the top 10, 12 investment banks. And so the, the top line has been reduced. The flip side, after the crisis, 2009, uh, the cost of regulation, you know, MIFI II, Dodd-Frank, was, you know, exploded. There's been uh, 30, 40 percent of growth of, uh, at least as, by different estimates, of the cost of regulation, regulator interpretation, regulator implementation. So there simply was not <laughs> sort of that infinite amount of money to throw at the problem. And so I think that's always a good, you know, um, motivator for any industry to start looking at more advanced and efficient solutions to address technology issues. Um, massive trends started happening in terms of technology, uh, you know, decentralized uh, finance uh, and sort of in a way threatening the very definition of what a financial institution is. Um, the fintech, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, movement and say set of startups that started to really focusing on very specific use cases with a much more sort of customer centric, digitally native approach. So really kind of changing the, the very definition of, uh, again, uh, uh, the value that a bank or a financial institutions as we know it uh, could deliver. And even more recently, I mean, the, the whole game stonk, <laughs> uh, you know, you probably followed uh, what happened, you know, early last year, early this year, was it? Yeah, this year, with, you know, retail investors, in a way, uh, being able now to access the, the uh, trading ecosystem and, you know, being able to, in a way, manipulate <laughs> uh, uh, something that, you know, uh, wasn't, wasn't there before. And so, again, drastic changes in the ecosystem. And finally, I think uh, that's really important, you know, uh, this is an industry that has been leading in the past from a technology standpoint. And more and more they want to continue to become technology companies. Uh, uh, you know, I've heard it more and more from several of the banks that I work with, especially at sea level, whether they consider themselves a technology company or they want to become a technology company. 
um, you know, there's certainly been a mandate uh, uh, from the top levels to behave more and more, you know, like the West Coast. Uh, uh, and and um, so main strategic drivers that are driving, again, a, a new approach to technology. And so in 2018, about three years ago, we expanded the Symphony Software Foundation into Finos. We realized that there was, you know, a, the, 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 the time was right, uh, fertile, to uh, create an actual open source foundation that would be uh, working across the industry. Well, let alone it's not a platform, uh, it's a foundation, but you know, some Forbes will take it. Uh, <laughs> um, again, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, but um, we launched in 2018. Um, I think the two, I think, Im important things to notice uh, are in 2018, 2019, we started collaborating on standards first because the industry wasn't yet, many of the financial institutions were not ready to contribute to open source, and still many are not. Um, and so a standard, it's something that are, they're more familiar with, they're more comfortable with. Uh, you know, there is maybe processes that are uh, uh, in place already for banks to participate to gain standardization bodies. And so we saw that as an initial um, sort of success. FDC3 is one of our, our, our most successful standards. The second aspect is that contributions were mainly coming from vendors, as you would expect. Uh, vendors, again, are more akin to open source, are more uh, ready to, to contribute, and they you know, want to put themselves in the face of, the, of their customers. Um, that really started to switch and change in 2020. Um, you know, we want to take some credit as, as a foundation to have helped the movement. But there's also been, you know, a big sort of broader digital acceleration that we've seen through the pandemic. Um, I remember as an example, almost like a joke, um, when we launched the foundation, we were using GoToMeeting as a, as a meeting tool. Every bank was like, no, 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 no. you got to move to WebEx. That's the only thing that we can use. So please, just WebEx. By mid-2020, when I was sending WebEx links, people were like, dude, you're not on Zoom yet? Like, <laughs> banks, in three months, they became like the most hipster uh, uh, meeting tool. It's like, okay, well, you guys got me to use WebEx. Anyway, that's just a funny story to say that we think that, that having to learn or, or run their business in a fully distributed environment made them more comfortable to a sort of naturally distributed model like open source contribution. And so we started to see major contributions from Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Deutsche Bank and Citi, these five major financial institutions, which are indeed the ones that you see before in the leaderboard. Um, how have we done that? As I said, I would like to take some credit, but <laughs> of course, there, there's, it's broader than just Finos. But what, uh, there's a couple of points that I want to make here. As I said before, we have been more high touch, I think, than other foundations. When a community like this is, is not as mature in open source, we had to put a lot of effort on our membership side to, again, show the value to this large organization, show the ROI, and of course, to our projects, um, you know, some open source projects are largely, you know, or self-sustained, uh, organically growing. Uh, in our case, we had to really coach our community. Uh, a lot of, of the value that we brought through our sort of project success uh, moniker, it was really, um, you know, not only governance, but also, you know, a project really fostering con consumption and contribution to our project and really community building. So. Um, I mean, those are two important aspects to, to see that, to say that, um, you know, there's been a lot of help from, from the team and, of course, the Linux Foundation now. Um, we'll talk about the other blocks in a little bit, but I want to, uh, so wh where are we now? Um, just trying to, again, be on time. Um, we released, you know, we, we've seen these trends sort of playing out over the last two or three years. Um, but I'm, I'm a data guy, and I really wanted to have an actual baseline of quantitative data uh, that we can use over time. 
not only to direct our efforts, but really even to show value to our members and to our uh, industry more in general. In fact, the board uh, uh, commissioned this report and you know, we are chartered to grow open source in financial services, not just on our members, not just in our community. And so having a really good baseline of where the industry is uh, in terms of the state of open source in financial services will serve us for the future, um, hopefully to show positive growth. Uh, hopefully. Um, couple, of, couple of, I think, key takeaways. Um, I think the first point is the industry has made major inroads into understanding the value, the strategic value of open source akin to what other industries do. Um, it's an interesting quote from, from one of our board members that says, I think it's very true, you know, financial services has had to solve big, complex innovation problems long ago. Uh, things like microservices, things like um, messaging protocols. They just didn't go viral <laughs> until someone open sourced them. And that someone was likely not a financial institution 10, 15 years ago. And so it is widely understood that innovation and, and becoming, going back to again to that mandate to be technology companies, open source can really be a great vehicle for that. But not just innovation, you know, time to market, total cost of ownership. I mean, those are the common uh, um, reasons that as, as people in the open source community we know and we feel uh, open source can bring. So it's great to see that, that you know, executives in financial services are, are now realizing this as a, as a potential value and driver for open source. Not only you know, contributing, but also influencing upstream. Uh, I think that's a really important point. Um, when we created the foundation, one of the reasons that, that you know, we, we really created this sort of vertical, you know, vertically focused open source community, open source foundation, was to be able to sort of collate the, you know, collective feedback of the industry when it comes to also upstream software. And so that's why we also joined the Linux Foundation. We, you know, part of that was really, we can bring the perspective of the financial services industry as a whole to, you know, Kubernetes, the Linux kernel, the Node, Electron. These are all building blocks that are used uh, very much in the industry. Now, unfortunately, uh, there's still a long way to go. Only 8% of uh, folks that were interviewed have you know, talked about a clear upstream uh, contribution policy uh, in their firms. Um, again, granted that this is one of the most mature things that I think an organization can do. Uh, but again, it shows you that there's still a long way to go and you know, OSPOs uh, do help in that direction. Look, it's not all bad. Like having 65% of the respondents that have a policy on consumption is way further than where I thought we would be today or even, you know, let alone three years ago. That said, and this may be very relevant for you guys, only 35% has an OSPO. Um, look, I, I qualitatively this year, even in the last 12 months, we've seen, I mean, I know at least of six, seven firms who have hired open source program office or the likes of it. Maybe they're not called exactly open source program office, but you know, they're hiring open source experts um, uh, to structure their governance and their internal approach to open source. So it's a good sign, but we're still, you know, still a lot of work to do there. Um, and I think part of the reason, I mean, if you go and download the report, there are much more insights. Again, I only have two or three minutes left, so I want to make sure uh, I, I don't steal the next presenter's time. Part of it was the lack of senior leadership when it comes to open source. I think the strategic value of open source is understood, but it's still not yet at sea level. Um, we've had, in a few cases it is, but um, you know, we published recently an article that it's called why you need a chief open source officer. Um, and I'm really trying to hammer that conversation in, in many of the financial institutions that we interact with. Um, that is why, um, and granted we'd like to work much more closely with the, with the to-do group here, uh, but one of the areas that we've always focused on before and after joining the Linux Foundation was what we call open source readiness. It's really providing support in terms of policies, 
in terms of culture, in terms of strategic understanding of open source. Uh, and one of, you know, we have a reference open source policy that banks can use, was originally open source by, by one institution. We have a license compliant handbook. You know, of course, many of these activities are, are independent from the industry that you're working on. You know, they do apply to any industry that is trying to do open source. But, you know, these industries like to consider themselves as a special snowflake. And so, uh, no, there are certainly regulatory concerns and compliance concerns that are very specific to this industry. So, again, this is a project that we continue investing on. And again, I would like to work much more closely with sort of, I see the to-do group as sort of upstream to us, uh, in a way, um, because ultimately this is going to unlock more and more value in the organization and the member that participate to the, to the foundation. We're starting to see the signs of not only the technology organization, you know, getting value um, within, an, you know, not only the IT uh, organization within a bank getting value out of open source. We have several projects that enables, enable that. Uh, but moving beyond that, uh, we now have projects that are actually initiated by the business. Um, because of you know better interaction with their clients, better interaction with regulators, even better collaboration with their peers. Again, this realization that not you know all the, the software that is built in a bank is actually a competitive differentiator. And then, last but not least, we are seeing a glimpse of uh, again to the point of strategic value of open source, really driving your technology strategy to open source, through open source, something that tech firms sort of do on a daily basis. We're starting to see a glimpse of it, but as we discussed before, there's still much more to do in terms of strategic awareness uh, um, at senior leadership in, in these organizations. Um, I am fairly out of time, but check out Legend. This is one of the projects that is showing potential for both sort of tech org and uh, uh, business organization value. Um, and this is a good uh, um, success story that we're using a lot to demonstrate value. Perspective is a over a thousand stars open source project, uh, open source by JP Morgan. Another uh, firm, another of our, of our platinum members has been able to you know, uh, uh, demonstrate ROI. Again, this is an industry, again, everyone is interested in, everyone is driven by ROI, but certainly this is an industry that particularly wants to know sort of line by line, <laughs> why am I doing this and what's the return on investment? Um, I think this is, again, this is not, by, by far it's not a complete analysis of the ROI that, that using an open source project brings, but it's pretty powerful to see that another of our platinum members was able to, again, demonstrate internally over $3 million savings by not developing that component. It's a very, you know, simple uh, model, but, but I think a pretty powerful one. I'll close to say, and I touched on this, there's many ways to contribute. I do think that ultimately code uh, uh, is what differentiates us from other standard bodies and from you know, other type of collaborative efforts. But you, you know, not everyone is there yet, as we discussed. And so special interest groups are a good way of, again, bringing people together more in the problem space, you know, identifying common interests, common problems, and then hopefully from there, spin off uh, uh, you know, an open source project on an open standard that can solve that problem. And with that, I just want to say, we talked about corporate, um, go, you know, corporate values and corporate ROI a lot, but communities are made of, of individuals, ultimately. Um, there's still a lot of you know, people that do work beyond uh, their sort of day job. I see that still in our community. So again, I think it's important to also, you know, uh, remember and reward and incentivize individuals. And that means both sort of in the standard community building uh, uh, mode that I think we are, we are aware of, but also, you know, I'm working a lot with our, with our board to make sure that they have internal incentives and internal uh, time being given to uh, work on open source. Because we think that whether you are financial institution, 
a fintech a regulator or an individual, there is value in open source collaboration. This should be a positive sum game ultimately, and that's you know what we're trying to pass as a message. And I think apart from <laughs> the long build, thank you and sorry for going uh, a little long. I, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and hit me up. I'll be out there. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, so um, <coughs> feel free to yes. reach out to, to Gab um, and the, during the break.